four of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and we've uh, already done a lot in uh, this study. Over the last three weeks, we looked at uh, the Beatitudes, and we looked at those states of blessedness that uh, Jesus came to reveal, where he begins to differentiate uh, between the ways of the world and the ways of the kingdom of God. Uh, to turn the ways of the world upside down and give a, a, a really counter-cultural, uh, counter-intuitive teaching about uh, the humble and the meek and the poor in spirit, uh, those who aren't self-reliant and those who aren't puffed up. Um, he came to give a teaching uh, about those being uh, the ways of blessedness with God. He uh, came, uh, Jesus tells us, uh, that he came not to abolish the law, uh, but to fulfill the law. And then what he does in the Sermon on the Mount after he establishes, I'm not going to break everything up that's come before. Uh, he doesn't come to abolish all the Old Testament laws. Uh, but he then begins to clarify for us in the Sermon on the Mount what those laws were intended uh, to be. And he begins that discussion about what the, the, the fulfillment of the law really looks like and the intention of the law really looks like uh, by, by discussing matters of the heart. And so this last week we were talking about uh, being angry in your heart and about how Jesus says that that's uh, sort of like being angry uh, outside uh, of your heart. Uh, uh, and it's like murdering your brother. And then he talks about... Uh, Lust in our hearts and how lust on the inside uh, is very much like uh, committing uh, adultery. And so Jesus, we can see in this Sermon on the Mount, one of the things he's doing is he's really ratcheting up the standard of behavior. And he's really clarifying for us, what was the law all about? Of course, when we talk about the law, we're talking about uh, the commandments of God that are given uh, throughout the Old Testament. And so Jesus, who, who knows these commandments so well, of course we think was, was behind these commandments, has in fact come to perfectly reveal what the commandments were all about. And then we transition to this teaching here in Lesson 4. We're picking up in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 31, all the way to the end of the chapter through um, Matthew 5:48. You might say that this, uh, this particular session is all about some of the, the most difficult teachings of Jesus. These are all the hard teachings. Of course, the other priests didn't want to give this particular lecture. They punted that uh, to me. And, and, you know, being the guy who always leads with his chin, uh, here I am talking about uh, these incredibly difficult teachings of Jesus. So, so from Matthew 5, 31 to the end of the chapter, we're getting into some really difficult and some controversial stuff, uh, stuff that, that I would suspect every single person who's engaging in this study and everybody who watches this video uh, will find it a little bit uncomfortable. Jesus is pushing us a little bit out of our comfort zones. He's pushing the people of his own day way out of their comfort zones. Uh, and because we're not all that different than those people, um, it will be difficult for us too. But, but let's just make sure we have in sight um, something important. We don't want to be the type of followers of Jesus who, who you might describe sort of as fair weather followers. You know, it's like... Uh, 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 Cowboys fans, you know, fair weather fans, you know, and they show up when everything's going great and oh, rah, rah, I love Dallas Cowboys. And then uh, when the team stinks and uh, boy, that seems to be what's happening right at the moment, uh, then you don't watch the games and you couldn't care less. Well, you know, if that's the way we are as Christians, uh, I think maybe we've missed the entire point of what Jesus uh, is trying to get us to focus on. Because, uh, as I said just a second ago, Jesus is himself the perfect revelation of God the Father. He, he shows us uh, the meaning of life. Uh, all eternity uh, meets in this one person, the person of Jesus Christ. 
And so if we want to just sort of take him uh, when it's easy, rather than when uh, his teachings are both the easy ones and the hard ones, if we just want to take the easy ones, then we will have missed the whole point. We'll have cut out the whole foundation of Christianity uh, underneath ourselves. So if we're going to do this at all, then we've got to engage in, in both the easy teachings of Jesus, the ones that we all like and the ones that are popular and the ones that are uh, culturally correct. Um, and we've got to engage in the more difficult ones as well. So this particular lecture that you're watching, it's an exercise in engaging in some of the more difficult teachings, the ones that, that push us off to the edge of our seat. Uh, just a little bit. But again, if we're going to do this at all, then we have to sort of say, he is the perfect revelation of God the Father, and the scripture uh, accurately captures what God intend, intends to communicate. Or, or something skewed, and then if something skewed, then the whole thing unravels really quickly. So these are hard teachings. Let me just say before we jump into the specifics of the hard teachings, uh, Jesus is revealing the law. He's revealing uh, what, uh, what was intended um, uh, in the moral law of God. And I think we have this in sight, but I just want to make sure that we, we identify it. As we read through the Old Testament, there's sort of two different types of law. Uh, there's the moral law of God, where God cares about the way we behave and think and act um, towards one another, towards him. And then there's what's called the rabbinical law or the cultic law, the law of the cult of Israel. Let me just give you an illustration uh, of each one. So uh, the Ten Commandments are moral laws. Uh, you should not commit adultery. You should lie. You should have no other gods. Uh, these are moral laws, but um, uh, the kosher laws, for instance, of the Old Testament, these are laws that belong to the cult of Judaism. Uh, they're wise and they're good and they're well-intentioned for the time that they're given, uh, but they're not moral and therefore they don't last forever. They're situational laws. Now, some people, as they're interpreting the Old Testament, they, they want uh, all of the laws to be abolished. But Jesus tells us very clearly that that's not what he came to do. He doesn't abolish any laws. He fulfills them. And what we understand from St. Paul's ministry, where uh, the, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, it's for, for Jew and for Gentile. We understand that the cultic laws, those situational laws, those those uh, kosher laws and things like that, those are dispensed in the New Testament, okay? In the new covenant that's established in Jesus' blood, uh, we don't have to continue those on, which is why you and I, for instance, uh, I, I don't know about you, I love bacon, right? So you get to eat bacon and I get to eat bacon, uh, but that's one of the laws in the Old Testament of the cult, right? You, you can't eat anything with, with a, I think it's a cloven hoof. And so Jews don't eat bacon. Uh, to this day, the strict Jews don't eat bacon. Uh, but we can eat bacon because those laws are dispensed. But uh, you should not commit adultery or you should lie. Well, well Jesus, those laws aren't dispensed. Uh, as much as some people in our culture might want them to be dispensed, the, those laws are in effect. God's moral law lasts forever. So we need to just distinguish that real quick because it helps us to understand what is Jesus up to as he's uh, preaching this sermon? And again, this sermon's all about ratcheting up the level of what God expects from us. And as this chapter ends, we're going to see that, that Jesus kind of pushes things through the roof. All right, so the first topic that Jesus tackles here in Matthew 5.31 the first topic that he uh, tackles is divorce. And before we talk about divorce, let's just make sure we all understand what uh, marriage is. Because what we see is Jesus is taking a pretty strong stand 
uh, against divorce. Jesus is, is not a fan. I don't know anybody who is particularly a fan. I don't know anybody like, oh, divorce is amazing. Everybody should get divorced, you know? Um, but Jesus is going to tell us that this is a really dangerous thing. Divorce is something we want to keep our eyes out uh, for um, and be very wary of. But let's define marriage. Uh, of course, marriage is, is right at the heart of so much confusion in our culture and, and, and if we're being honest, within uh, the Christian church itself. Marriage is uh, what we would, here's how we would describe it traditionally. A lifelong, loving, exclusive union between a, a man and a woman. So a lifelong, loving, exclusive uh, man and woman. And the Book of Common Prayer, and they're united in, in heart, body, and mind. That's how the Book of Common Prayer describes it. And the Book of Common Prayer tells us that there's several purposes for marriage, that, that it's given by God um, for the help and comfort given one another in prosperity and adversity, uh, for, for the couple's mutual joy. Uh, so we're supposed to, husbands and wives are supposed to help each other in good times and bad. It's supposed to be joyful. Um, sometimes that one may be out of sight. Uh, and then the third one is for the procreation of children when it's God's will and for their nurture and knowledge and the love of the Lord. Those are the three purposes of marriage that are described in the, in the Book of Common Prayer. So we know that marriage is this thing that God blesses, this, uh, this state of life where God is going to work powerfully. And, and in fact, uh, the, the intention... Uh, is that couples love each other uh, so much that this, this, this marriage will be then the mechanism by which God blesses the world with new life. Uh, this is the procreation of children and their nurture and knowledge uh, and, and, uh, and knowledge and love of the Lord. Uh, the reason divorce, the Lord wants us to be careful about divorce and he wants us uh, to see what a great danger divorce is really has to do with what we think couples are supposed to be doing in marriage. So remember that, uh, that St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, when he talks about marriage, he compares it, uh, the love of husband and wife, he compares it to the love between Christ and and the church. Everybody's heard that, and every time we call people up here to have the marriage blessings, got to be on that side, not on that side, apparently. Uh, but every time we call people up here, that's what we say, you know, that, that we're praying that their life together would be a reflection of the love between Christ and his church. That's language that's lifted out of Paul's teaching on marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. Well, think about what, what the relationship of Christ and his church is. Jesus, he loves us unconditionally. He, uh, he loves us with no limit. He loves us um, in good times and in bad times. Uh, he loves us so much that he gives his life for ours. That's how Jesus loves the church. And you can think about the tremendous amounts of grace that are poured out over and over again uh, in, in the life of every believer, in the life of all believers. Uh, and you can think about the tremendous lim links that people are willing to go in pursuit of their love of Jesus. Uh, the tremendous sacrifices that everyone who's watching this video has made uh, because we love the Lord and we're trying uh, to follow him to the best of our ability. Um, the sacrifices of time, the sacrifices of, of financial resources. You, you can think about uh, the, the love of Jesus that motivates missionaries to go into uh, hostile territories. You know, Christian people are willing to do a lot. Well, this is the type of love that husbands and wives are really supposed to have for each other. That's what Paul says. And so the reason that Jesus warns us about divorce is because it really, when we get towards divorce, it, it demonstrates uh, some differentiation uh, with this type of love. It, it, divorce and this type of 
passionate love where there is no length to which a husband and wife won't go for each other. That's the type of love that there is between Christ and the church. Um, divorce represents a breakdown in that. It, it, it represents a, 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 a coming short of that. Because here's, here's ultimately the thing. I mean, uh, Jesus isn't giving up on anybody in the church. And the really sad, tragic thing about divorce is it, it is in some way it's a person uh, giving up. There may be all kinds of good reasons that, that may motivate a decision towards that. So don't hear me saying that there's not. Uh, uh, sometimes there are incredibly abusive and, and toxic uh, situations that are anything but joyful and loving. Remember, those are parts of the definition of marriage. But it represents a departure from the type of love that, that Jesus uh, has for his church and the type of love that husbands and wives are called to give one another. So divorce is this a difficult thing, uh, and Jesus is revealing to us the intention uh, of the law, do not commit uh, adultery. So, so Jesus is taking that uh, law and again ratcheting it up, calling us to live these really selfless lives as husbands and wives. Uh, he, he moves on from there. He gives the next teaching about turning the other cheek. So he says, you know, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, uh, turn, turn the other to them also. Again, this is a very difficult teaching. Uh, and we can think of all kinds of, of situations where we say, no, 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 no. I mean, self-defense seems like a much better option uh, than turning the cheek. What if somebody's abusing you? You know, are you supposed to be just a doormat for that uh, abuse? Uh, of course the answer is is no what Jesus is not asking us to do is to uh, live in abusive situations and it's a misinterpretation of the Sermon on the Mount that that might lead to that conclusion what Jesus is trying to get us to focus on here is that uh, there's great strength in sacrificial love. Sometimes we think that there's great strength in revenge. Sometimes we have this uh, understanding where if somebody hits you, uh, you hit them back and you hit them harder. Uh, but Jesus, and that's what, that, that makes you a strong person. But Jesus is saying that this is not what makes someone a strong person. Uh, remember for, for the Lord, uh, and I, what I would hope for all of us, that the, the strongest force in all of creation is love. And anything that is short of, of love in the way that Jesus would show it, it, it is not as strong as Christ's unconditional love. And so when he asks us to turn uh, the cheek, what he's trying to get us to see is that you know, if we're sort of aimed at lesser goals like revenge or pettiness, uh, rather than at higher virtues like love and, and forgiveness, then we are necessarily weaker uh, by pursuing those lesser goals. He continues on this line of thinking when he tells us uh, next, love your enemies and pray for them. And again, surely this has to be one of the most difficult teachings in all of the Bible. I mean, sometimes people uh, really wrong us and they hurt us in life. And it is incredibly difficult to get to the place where we could even think about loving them. Uh, or, or praying for them. This is, a, I heard a priest one time talking about this command to love your enemies and pray for them. And I remember him saying something like, even if you got to spit the words out of your mouth and maybe insert a few creative, colorful four-letter words before your enemy's name, you still have to pray for them. And it's this part of the spiritual life um, that, that we really don't 
want to pursue. I think if we're being honest, it's, it's very difficult what Jesus is asking. He's, he's saying, those people in your life that have hurt you, sometimes who, who have hurt you and wounded you really deeply, those are people that you have to pray for. Again, what God is, is wanting for all of us is to live in, in perfect communion with, with him and with, with one another. That's what Jesus came to do. It's what the cross, the purpose of Jesus' cross is, uh, to unite us to God the Father, to unite uh, all men and women uh, to one another. And so when we live uh, at odds uh, with any other person, then in some way, uh, the power of the cross is diminished. And the Christian sees that, and the Christian says, okay, it's not easy, but I'll work towards that type of love, and that will necessarily involve uh, reconciliation. If it's just hate the crud out of your enemies, belittle everybody, never think of somebody who wrongs you again, think about the chaos uh, that the world would be in. I think we're seeing some of that chaos uh, right now um, as people have moved so far away from Judeo-Christian ideas. But if Christians aren't uh, agents of reconciliation, then what are we? And what do we share in common with the Lord that we follow? So turning our cheek is very difficult it's a very high form of love and, and loving our enemies uh, rather than, than dismissing them uh, and being at peace with that type of enmity. Uh, loving them surely ratchets uh, the bar up and it calls us to this very hard and this very high form of self-giving, sacrificial love. And then we get to the last verses here in chapter 5. Uh, and, and the last verse that this chapter ends with has got to be, I think, one of the most difficult and one of the most frightening verses in all of Scripture. Because Jesus, after, again, you can sort of see him ratcheting up the level of expectation. And he's telling us, here's the type of love that I'm calling you to live with. And then he says, finally, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So now we know what the standard of uh, Jesus' expectations are for us. He wants us to live the life of God. To be in the world as our heavenly Father is. And surely that has got to be the most difficult verse in all of scripture because I think if you're like me, you're all too aware of your own imperfections. Uh, and the moment that you think you're making some progress in the spiritual life to you're sort of aware of how much backsliding there is and you take a step forward and you take a step back and you wonder how much towards perfection you're really, if you're ever making any progress. But this is what the Sermon on the Mount does. What we don't want to think is that Jesus is kind of setting the bar down here. Because uh, that's not what he's doing. I mean, this is a very high bar that Jesus is uh, describing for discipleship, uh, for following him, for what it means uh, to think and act and behave like a follower of Jesus Christ. We're told in this section that our thoughts matter, the thoughts of anger, the thoughts of lust. Um, these things matter. Uh, we're told that, that the type of love that we love others with, it matters, and all of it is through this rubric of, of striving to live the life of God, striving to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Sometimes I think we, we think in the Christian faith that perfection is, is something that we are destined for long term, right? In eternity, in heaven, in life with God, that, 
that things will be perfected there, and that's true. But you notice here that Jesus doesn't say, hey, when you get to heaven, be perfect, as our Heavenly Father is perfect. He's drawing this as a standard of our discipleship now. And so we try to live the life of God here. Uh, we experience the grace of God here. Uh, and then we try to love with God's perfect and unconditional love. We're broken. We can't do it on our own. We need lots and lots of help and, and grace from the Lord. Uh, but this is the standard of behavior that God calls us to. So uh, some difficult stuff in this particular section. And I hope these discussions, if you're participating in the crossword discussions, I hope that some sense of the, the difficulty of the Christian life comes uh, across. Remember that this is not an easy enterprise, especially if we're engaging with these teachings um, that Jesus is giving us here in Matthew chapter. This is not a low bar. I mean, Jesus says, take up your cross. I mean, essentially, you know, you're going to have to die to self uh, and live with selflessness. So that's what he's calling us to here. And that's where it all leads into this last phrase of Matthew 5. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So we strive for perfection. We strive to live the life of God. We strive to follow in the steps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what this uh, section is all about, uh, and I hope that this has been uh, helpful and beneficial to you as we try to unpack these powerful words of our Lord. God bless you.